Cody, my rookie process every year starts with you. You're, you're, you know, it's become like a little bit of a, a tradition for me, but I found that since rookie content, rookie analysis starts earlier and earlier every year, that we're in the end of February, early part of March, and people are already bored of their own takes. Yeah. And I see things that, you know, that are a little crazy and a, a big departure from the original. So I, I have noticed that because you know i follow what you're doing uh across your your social media and you have not departed you've made little eeks and changes and tweaks but with nothing that's really happened since the end of the college season i always find it fascinating that people make such drastic changes uh how do you remain disciplined and basically not fall into that hoe on board of my own takes uh takes business I think the biggest takeaway uh, from that process is year over year building and innovating your own process. But I think I've gotten to a point now where we get to see these players during the year, right? So you have a whole season to watch them on the weekends. You don't have to study them. Just watch them on the weekends, make notes here and there. When the season ends, dive into the tape, right? Get done with the tape, be done with the tape. And the, the, the very cool benefit of working at Roster Watch, and when I worked at Player Profile, it was the same thing because I worked, I basically worked with Roster Watch this time of year, was going to the Senior Bowl, going to the Shrine Bowl, going to the Combine, going to the Pro Days. And I don't have to sit here and go back and watch tape. I don't have to have a conversation with somebody. And they go, yeah, you need to go watch more of X. No, I don't. I, I watched him. I saw him during the year. I watched the tape. And now guess what? I'm going to go talk to him at the combine and, you know, I might go to his pro day and there's going to be things through the process that I just continue to stack onto the file. So yes, perhaps a, you know, a receiver could bump up a couple spots through the process, but it's not going to be because I was bored, went back and I was looking, ah, man, he didn't, he didn't run this route exactly how I wanted to. And that's what you see a lot of times on Twitter is people just, they, they only have film to lean back on or analytics, and so they dive so deeply into that one thing that they get caught in a spot that is, you know, accustomed to changing and, you know, critiquing, splitting hairs that you don't need to split. Yeah. Before we get into our, our top rookies that you must draft, and we'll go with, do this from super flex, from single quarterback, and we'll just take them one by one. You'll give me your, your lightning round stuff. I'm sure that, um, and then I'll ask you questions again. The reason I started this dynasty podcast was not because I was some sort of film guru or analytics guys, because I listened to a lot of dynasty podcasts and there was the, uh, the hosts of podcasts were not asking the questions that I wanted answered. So I was like, you know what? I'll do a, uh, I play in a lot of dynasty leagues and, and I'm going to have a lot of guys on that. I, I like what they're saying, or it's a total selfish podcast. It's basically to answer questions in my own league. So I hope you don't mind that I'm using you like that. But, uh, <laughs> uh so let's start at the top real quick here. Um, you know, Caleb Williams quarterback USC. I mean, you, there's no way that he's not going to be the number one overall pick. Is there any world in the real NFL that, that Caleb is not the 101 in the real NFL draft. There's a world. Uh, I don't think that world exists in which a receiver is the one that take that overtakes that spot. Of course, if a trade happens, okay, whatever. Um, but as it currently stands today, I if the I would put 95 to five percent, 95 percent okay. likely it's Caleb, and that five percent exists for a Drake or a Jaden Daniels to go to the combine and look head and shoulders better than everybody else. I don't expect Caleb Williams to throw at the combine next Saturday or next Friday, but I do expect most of these other guys to do it because I think that they do feel they have to close that gap or they have a chance to surpass it. That's, you know, any competitive player should think that. So there's a slight chance, you know, Jaden Daniels runs a 4-4-1. Jaden Daniels, you know, blows the top off of uh, uh, of Lucas Oil next week and looks head and shoulders better than everybody else. Of course, there's an opportunity, but I would say 95% Caleb. You know, what's funny is that Caleb Williams reminds me a lot of um, the narrative stuff around CJ Stroud last year, right? And Caleb Williams is going to be the presumed 101. Stroud was never really, I mean, he was, you know, there was a debate whether he was going to be 101 or 102, but it's like, you know, there it, it, just because he's not, quote, generational, the Andrew Luck, the Trevor Lawrence, but look, that stuff didn't really work out. You know, I mean, Andrew Luck was a really good player for a couple of years, but he, he's not Peyton Manning. He's not Tom Brady. I mean, generational means Patrick Mahomes, right? I mean, it's, it's a chance to be on the Mount Rushmore, at least like in the queue. I wouldn't say, you know, so just 
quickly here, what is, do you think, the the floor? Because I don't care about the upside. We always know the upside of the 101 is being the best quarterback in the league. What is the floor of Caleb Williams? And again, for these conversations, I'm going to presume that Chicago makes the pick. The floor as far as the NFL draft capital? And no, floor as far as what his performance will be. for. Because if I'm in a super flex league, I have the 101 in a league. That's the guy I'm taking. I'm not really deviating from this. So if I need a quarterback in a super flex league, what's the... Trevor Lawrence, I could say, is a good example because when I took him at 101 in one of my leagues, I'm getting what I the floor of what I thought he could be. I have not seen the ceiling outcome. Yeah. So what is the floor of Caleb Williams for fantasy football if people are thinking about taking him at the first pick in their in their dynasty draft? The fl- the floor is whatever you uh, – this, this is a good – Alan, you brought it up, right? The jump. I, I, I started this podcast to ask the questions that people don't ask, and the, I haven't been asked this question all year. And I don't think people want to hear what the floor is for a Caleb Williams. Like, I don't think people are ready to wrap their head around that. I think the floor for a Drake May is much higher. I think the floor for even a Jaden Daniel is much higher than a floor is for Caleb Williams. And, you know, you can bring in all the off field stuff. I don't really want to talk about that. I'm not a big fan of that. But I think that those things do have to be brought into this conversation. And the floor for a Caleb Williams, I don't think is a Johnny Manziel situation. Um, but real, real I, man, Johnny Manziel doing blow in between quarters and stuff, you know, why not? But I think I, I, I don't think that that's his floor. Uh, a floor is for fantasy footballs more than, more than likely he settles in and the gimmicky stuff doesn't work. And he, you know, he doesn't turn into having the, 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 uh, you know, one of the most talented arms of all time. Like we've talked about with Patrick Mahomes and Aaron Rodgers, and defenses figure him out and, and he's got the rushing upside. So I, I think the floor is probably somewhere around that QB 13 to 16 area. Um, as far as like you're looking back in two years and he's just there. And what, where, I mean, where's Trevor Lawrence right now? He's kind of in that same area where the expectation was mildly high and Caleb has mild legs. Trevor Lawrence, they were, he was one of the anointed ones before he was drafted. Yeah. Yeah, you did draft him, what, sixth or seventh overall in that one QB mock? Yeah, well, and <laughs> that was a still better pick than Javante Williams in that draft. That's facts. That's facts yeah. right now. So, so anyway, um, so so you're saying, like, again, I'm just going to throw some uh, – Baker Mayfield's – the best part of Baker Mayfield's career, is that a floor outcome? Like, is he a secure 101, or should I not even be – should I be thinking a little bit uh, bolder? You said it's the floor for someone like Drake May, uh, the quarterback of North Carolina, it has a higher floor. Um, it, I mean – is basically here's the question: Is Caleb Williams a no-brainer one hundred and one in Superflex? If I just don't want to screw up the pick, no. Um, I again, I draft capital is going to come into it. It comes in every year for quarterbacks. It just it comes in every year for a lot of positions. But I think quarterback specifically this year, where New England's a tough one, and people are going to look at New England. People are going to look at Washington and think, "Well, oh, C.J. Stroud did it. Caleb can do it. Jaden can do it." Those those organizations are are not in the same spot that Houston was, where Houston put everything together. They're coming off of a brutal situation and they're building upwards. New England is nothing has told us that they're starting to go back up. They've been going down. Washington feels a little bit better, feels a little similar to to Houston. Um, I might feel a little bit better about that situation, but these quarterbacks, whichever spot they land in, Chicago is another one in the conversation. Uh, Atlanta, though, Atlanta feels like a very interesting spot where it could bump any of these quarterbacks up ahead of a Caleb potentially at the one-on-one that that spot is it's, it's fantasy gold. It feels like if the quarterback version, if Drake may goes to Atlanta, if JJ McCarthy goes to Atlanta, he's going to, he's going to jump up into the top six, top seven conversation. So you're saying Atlanta, the landing doubt. spot here is going to really be a rocket fuel for any of these guys. I, yeah. I, I could see potentially after the draft and, and that's really when most of the dynasty rookie drafts happen. You, you're talking, you know, May 5th to May 15th. And let's put Caleb Williams in new England. Hypothetically, new England goes up to one, they get Caleb and then Drake falls and goes to you know Drake goes to eight to to uh, Atlanta. I'm taking Drake May every time over Caleb Williams in Superflex. If if Drake is in Atlanta hypothetically, or or Jaden, and then Caleb's in a New England type of a situation, if that makes sense. All right, no, that does make sense. I, New England is the spot where nobody wants anybody to go. I mean, but you have to remember, it's really it. I mean, with the new coaching staff, I mean, what is it? Just that the roster is so depleted or you yeah. have, you, do you not have any faith in this new coaching? So I have more faith in New England this year than I do with a, you know, what the la- last version of Bill Belichick was. Sure, but we haven't seen, we yeah, it's the unknown. We haven't seen him do it and the roster so depleted. We just, 
we just have no idea how they're going to draft or what their abilities are going to be in the draft because it's it's been Belichick for 20 years. So it, it's going to be an interesting year one in New England. Just to, if they can nail a draft in the first year, it would be it's, it's going to be a tough it's going to be a tough thing to dial in. But if they can do it, it would uh, say you say you draft Caleb 101, right? Or say you trade up to get Caleb and you had that second round pick still and you go and get, you know, a Keon Coleman or somebody, Adnai Mitchell that can play outside. That's a different, it's a little bit of a different conversation. You add, add a couple offensive linemen and free agency that it starts to look a little, you know, glass half full instead of glass half empty. Cause right now it, that, that glass is almost empty. Yeah. I mean, you can't do, you can't have a worse perception of the new England Patriots than they do after that year. Uh, you, we we're talking about our top 10 rookies. All right, fine. Caleb aside, we're going to move on. Uh, Drake, uh, oh, by the way, uh, what's an ups? Who is your comp? I, I do follow your stuff, but who's your upside and downside comp for Caleb Williams? For, for Caleb, I, I I guess I don't really have a downside comp for the upside comp. I, I, I see a lot of Russ. I don't, I'm not Russ. going for this Patrick crap. This, this nah, Mahomes nah, nah. comparison. I don't, I don't see that. So I'm, I'm going, um, I'm going Russ. That's just my straight up comp. Okay. All right. Caleb Williams is off the board. Your dynasty rookie draft unlanded. Uh, let's say uh, Drake may does go number two to Washington. Jaden Daniels goes three to new England. Who are you taking uh, at your number two? Who's your number two rookie in your super flex drafts? Yeah, it'd be Drake may Drake may is the one I want in, in super flex. This is the one I want. I, I love Jaden Daniels. I think he brings a lot to the table in the running game and his arm, his, his, his yards per attempt increased, I think four, four and a half yards this year. And it was, you know, he had the talent around him to do it. He also had the rushing. It's a prolific season, no doubt. But we're talking about NFL and projecting. Talk about this every year. That's the quarterback's the hardest position to um, analyze and to break down. And being able to project a body type, arm talent, things of that nature is a lot easier than trying to act like you know what this guy is seeing um, in his brain. It's it's not yeah. as, you know... It, it, doesn't sound easy and it's not easy. So I, I like the traits that Drake may brings. I think he still has 10 to 15 pounds. He can add to his frame. And in super flex, I think Drake may brings uh, what people thought they were getting in Justin Herbert to the table. And also you got to like the, I mean, I love DJ Moore in Chicago, but I think I like the overall weapons in Washington. I think what, you know, the way you were talking about Atlanta is the way I was thinking about Washington. I mean, you know, Terry McLaurin is still one of the, you know, he's like Tyler Lockett, like underrated perennially, you know, like every yep. year as far as ever. And then I still think Jahan Dotson's a touchdown score. We saw, you know, down year last year, um, and then, you know, I don't know what they're going to end up doing. Uh, you know, Antonio Gibson set to leave, but I, I still like that team as far as fantasy football is concerned. Uh, it's very interesting. So Drake May, uh, what is his up? Who are you copying him to currently in the NFL? I I hate the, the big upside comps, but I, yeah. honestly, I think he's a better version of Justin Herbert. Okay. I don't want to say Josh Allen. I don't think the rushing is that prolific. He's 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 smooth at it. He's better than a Kirk Cousins at rushing, and rushing Kirk Cousins is very underrated. Uh, I don't think he's in the Josh Allen um, end of everything. Where I don't think he's going to have you know double digit rushing touchdowns per se, but I think he's what people thought they were getting in Justin Herbert. So Justin Herbert plus, I guess, will be the answer. Yeah, and you know when we talk about like draft capital, I think that there's a special draft capital insulation for like the 101. So put it this yeah. way, like. All right, Bryce Young last year, right? 101, couldn't have had a worse rookie season. He is going to get, at minimum, another year, right? So I don't think that that draft capital, even though it applies to pick two and pick three, look what happened to Trey Lance, right? I mean, he got evaporated after, before even a full year of, of getting started. So I, I that's why the other thing, when you talk about draft capital in general, I think outside of the 101, especially when that 101 is traded up for, that all bets are off. And then if you're like pick six or pick 10, I mean, it's almost unprotected in this sense. So um, leads me into, you know, you covered uh, Drake May. We covered Jane Daniels a little bit. Uh, Marvin Harrison, is he the, uh, I mean, despite, you know, some cute rankings, he is the number one wide receiver in this class. And I, I'm, you know, the way that most casuals have been hearing about it is that, is he the number one wide receiver in the last, handful of years three years five years where do you stack them up i think it's aggressive um i i i, I kind of got bit on twitter the other day for tweeting this out but i i love marvin harrison i love malik neighbors i love roma dunze those are the three best wide receiver prospects in this class correct and 
I think Malik Neighbors needs to be more in the conversation of wide receiver one than people are giving him credit okay. for. So you're Alex there. And I, you're, you're you're there I, that like this is not a clear cut one or the other. Not, this is this a lean is a towards cut. Harrison. It's a lean. This is yeah. This is not clear cut. And the reason I say that isn't because I'm saying Marvin's not good. Marvin's great, but Malik Neighbors needs to get the respect um, that he's due. He is again literally projected to be a top five NFL draft pick, and, and people are just forgetting. Like it's not that forgetting it, but they're just like, eh, it's okay. Mar Marvin though, Marvin's gonna be a top three pick. It's like, what are we? We're, we're splitting hairs right now. These are completely different body types. Marvin is 6'4", 205 pounds, um, not the best in contested situations, didn't create a lot after the catch, but he's a very good route runner for what he is. He can play downfield. He's going to run really 4-4-4-4-4-6 area, and of course he's the son of the great Marvin Harrison Jr. Marvin Harrison Sr., sorry. And he did it two straight years at Ohio State with dominance, and you know you could argue if he was in a different offense with a better quarterback, he might have went for 15, 16, 1,700 yards. But Malik Neighbors fits the archetype, and the archetype is Diggs, Jefferson, Amon Ross St. Brown, um, you know, to a certain extent, A.J. Brown, Jamar Chase, all of these guys in fantasy football that have continually, year after year, given us the output. Odell, all the way back to Odell Beckham. Odell Beckham was the original archetype. Six foot tall, 195 to 205. These guys secure catches like it's their job because it is. 160, 170 targets continually. You can bet on it. This is not 2005. Marvin Harrison is 6'4", 205. He's a great wide receiver, but he's not. We don't need this in fantasy football. This isn't the, the, the angle you're pushing for. He's going to be very viable. Again, I don't have him ranked. So Alex calls me a coward for this, but I put him 1-1. One, one. I'm not you're talking about Alex Dunlap over Alex Ross Dunlap, yes, yeah, Yes, sir. And I, I put him 1-1 one and one in the ranking. I ain't ranking one of them. I'm not, there's no number two in my rankings. It's one and one because they're two different wide receivers. They're two prolific. Th these are two of the best receivers we have seen over the last 10 years. And they're two of the best receivers we will see over the course of the next 10 years. And they just both have to be in the same draft class. They're both two different body types that are both successful in the NFL. But for fantasy football, I believe Malik neighbors is much more of a guarantee to give you that top five output in fantasy football over the course of the next 10 years. So it, it's, it's a long winded way of saying both guys are extremely talented, but if you are putting a gun to my head, I'm taking Malik over Marvin, but I love Marvin. Like the, you see where I'm at there? Yeah. So, so basically it let's, let's talk landing spot neutral for a moment here. If you're, let's say if, if you're, if those two guys are the next two guys, all three quarterbacks, for example, were taken one, two, and three in a draft and you're sitting there at four and the guy at five says, Hey, I'll move up one spot and give you a fourth no. round rookie pick. You're just doing no. it because you don't care the difference. Okay, so you're saying quarterback, quarterback. So, so basically, Malik Neighbors and Harrison are the next two obvious picks. You're yeah. on the clock before the guy behind you, right? Yeah. And you you see them as one and one. Gotcha. Right? Yep. So you'll take anything to move back one spot sure. and just take who but, falls to you. Not anything, though. Like you said, a fourth-round pick. Fourth-round pick, probably not. But, yeah, I mean, essentially, if you know, if it was – Hey man, I really want this guy. Okay, cool. Send me something. Like, give me right, some well, juice because I, I feel good about either one. Yeah, that's so what I'm saying. I'm going to step on the gas a little bit here. Step on you and yeah. say so. If you were on the clock and you didn't get any offers you like, which one are you actually going to? And landing spot neutral, which one are you going to take? Big money league, two hundred dollar, three hundred dollar league. I, I Malik, man, I'm taking okay. Malik. All I'm right. taking Malik. This, this is again. It's 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 a tough one because you get no way no matter how you answer the question if you answer the question like Marv it's like okay every, well, everybody knows that and I know he's really good but it, it, I don't want to say I'm trying to evade groupthink right but, but sometimes at the same just evading the public is a is a good strategy Cody it, it but get, yes and <laughs> I, I'm not doing it because of that that's a thing it's these guys are both extreme. This is a you know this, you go on for this forever, but it's it, these are extremely good wide receivers. All right, well They're then here be very successful, and I would uh, take Malik Neighbors. I'll give you a hypothetical then. Let's say that like uh, Marvin Harrison lands in Arizona indoor track with yep. or good weather with uh, Kyler Murray, and then Neighbors is in uh, Giants with uh, you know for at oh. least Daniel Jones for one year, and it's outdoors, yeah. tough NFC East. So I'm I mean, giving you a complete tier down, maybe tier and a half or two tiers down landing spots. So now. Does that at least push it the other way? I'm probably taking probably taking Marvin in that situation. Okay. All right, and that's a. By the way, what I just said there, those two spots are. I think that's yeah. like a fifty percent chance that could happen that way. 
Yeah, that's a tough. That'd be. A, I mean, neighbors can be successful there, but that's just a tough. It's going to be a tough offense to grow in when it seems like that thing's about to fall apart uh, in yeah. reality with the quarterback and the coach. Well, you could see. I, I've I've heard uh, whispers that the Giants are in the quarterback market. So, you know, there could be a team. Should the Giants move up, but yeah, who, who knows? We'll see what happens. They're they're pretty much locked unless they do the thing where they give somebody a pick to take Daniel Jones. They're locked in for one more year before they can feasibly get out of it. All right, so there's a big five, and then you know you you mentioned uh, your third wide receiver is Roma Dunze, and then there's Brock Bowers, who's the tight end uh, at Georgia. There, so let's say just you know normal premium tight end point and a half, which for me, never really moves the needle. It's just like, I yeah. just play it like a normal tight end. Let's start with Brock Bowers, man. Is yeah, I, There's a lot of enthusiasm for him. Um, there wasn't really a lot. I mean, I'm thinking back to like Eric Ebron, uh, you know, a yeah. decade ago when he was a first round tight end, there was enthusiasm. Then we kind of fantasy learned their lesson where eh, first round tight ends, it's not a great thing. I mean, now look, Sam Laporta and a lot of consensus rankings is tight end one, but he wasn't a first round pick. People like Dalton Kincaid from last year, but you know, he's barely itching at the top five. I mean, he's five, six, or seven, not, you know. So is Brock Bowers, is the hype warranted? If he's drafted in the first round, I'm not going to say top five, but if he's a top 20 pick, it goes to the Bengals, for example, a spot where we yeah. like the quarterback. Is that someone that we should be pushing people out of the way on our rookie drafts to get? What's the story on Brock Bowers for fantasy and his NFL outlook? I love Brock Bowers. However, I will never be a person that drafts a tight end in this area. I didn't draft any Kyle Pitts in this area. It worked out. Uh, Bowers is an extremely good wide receiver. He can play out wide just as uh, Kyle Pitts can. Uh, Bowers had 58% of his yards come after the catch in his career, second in the class behind Jaheim Bell, who didn't get nearly the usage out wide as Bowers did, and just 10% ahead of Jatavian Sanders, tight end two uh, from Texas, clearly in this class. Uh, Bowers is really good. But am I taking him in this first tier? No. I have six guys in my first tier. Um, two guys you mentioned before, Roma Dunze, Jaden Daniels are also in there with everybody else we talked about. And then I have Bowers in that next tier down. Bowers in Cincinnati would be ecstatic about that situation if Tyler Boyd doesn't return type of a situation. Uh, I, I think that obviously the range of outcomes for Bowers is to be the tight end one overall in dynasty and in fantasy football. But the slight frame does worry me a little. 6'3", 6'3 and a half. We'll see if he weighs in 232, 235 at the combine. I do not see a 240 coming. I would, I would, if if I was him again, even though you're going to weigh in light, 240 is light. You might as well weigh 232 and run a 4'4 four, four something. And I don't think that's out of the range of outcomes. Bowers is a really good tight end. I think he brings everything to the table. He's mild in the run blocking game, which is fine. It's not really expected. He's not going to be the George Kittle of a team. Uh, but Bowers is good, but I just I, I just don't feel good about spending that draft capital. I would much rather have a number of these wide receivers at this point or another quarterback um, before taking Bowers in, in, in Superflex with, without a premium. With a premium, with a premium, I don't even think I, I click on that button in the top eight. Okay. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting. I saw that picture, like everybody saw the one, him standing yeah. next to Gronk. He looks like Gronk's little brother, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's Gronk, so you can't really. I mean, every, I I posted something on my Twitter about Wembenyama in the NBA. I mean, like it's like saying, "Oh, but Shaq looks small next to Wembenyama." No shit, right? And it's like, Dude. come on, yeah, big boy, big boy. Um, I, I'm, you know, just uh, looking at some of like the the dynasty calculator stuff. I mean, again, that's just a guide; it's not a bible. I mean, Brock yep. Bowers is being traded as the number two tight end ahead of. I mean, they. I told you, Laporta is the number one guy, um, oh. and then Bowers is going mostly traded ahead of like or drafted ahead of McBride, Hawkinson, Andrews, Kincaid, Pitts, obviously Kelsey because of age. I mean, is that a fair ranking of him in Dynasty or is that basically wish casting a little bit there? It's a it's a little it's a little aggressive. I get it from a they I mean they're the, the thing what they're doing is they're pushing the value up or they're pushing the value down on getting him. It's it's you're getting to the point where you feel like you have to draft him, you know, at that six, seven, five, six, seven, eight spot yeah. in your rookie drafts because you know, well, the value's here, and maybe I can trade him at some point. But in reality, how I feel about that is I don't want to draft him in that spot because I don't think you can come in day one and just go for a thousand yards. Yeah, Pitts did it. Yeah, Laporta did it. But that's, I mean, 
we haven't seen that since Mike Ditka, man. That, that's Jeremy Shockey. Like you can list the guys. You can literally think of the guys that have done it and just to assume a guy that's going to come in that's undersized at that in position unless we fully expect this guy to be working 60% of the slot and then out wide a little bit like and, and work dominantly as a wide receiver, that would be a cheat code. Uh, and, and, it, and, if, and if we were told by Cincinnati, we're drafting this guy. He's playing 75% in the slot. He is Tyler Boyd. Different conversation. We're having an entirely different conversation. But the idea that he comes in as a tight end and he's used in that fashion, it's yeah, a lot of moving pieces there. So I think plugging him in as, as dynasty tight end two, dynasty tight end three right now is, is nuking any value or future value you're going to end up um, losing in that bet or, or holding a piece that doesn't really give you the output early on. So say you are a team that, like, you know, that um, you're ready to win, right? You just had yeah. some bad luck last year, and but you're missing a tight end. You're on the clock, right? Say pick six, pick seven, your rookie draft. Would you just trade away the pick for, like, Travis Kelsey, knowing that it's probably one or two more years max? But Travis Kelsey, even though he had a down year, did finish strong. And I love looking at how he finished. He could be, and Travis Kelsey could be entering that Gronk phase where they just kind of deploy him sparingly and then in the in the playoffs. But it does that age massive age chasm? Is that enough to like, basically is he un less certain of a prospect where you would just trade him away for a year or two of mercenary Kelsey? I, your situation would have to be situations are situational. Your situation would have to be completely as you, as you explained where I'm ready to win. Now this roster is loaded and Except I just I don't have, have a tight end. Right. I right. have Ladarius green at tight end. Like, okay. <laughs> Like remember them? <laughs> I, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to go out and just bet on Bowers being this nuclear weapon on day one. I, I'll, I'll go and take Kelsey. I maybe want. I'm, I'm, I might ask for some change with him, but okay. I would. I would. I would feel fine about going after getting Kelsey there, or you know, someone up there. I mean, just look at a Tony Gonzalez's stat line. He went until 37 years old. There's. I mean, the great Kelsey step. doesn't look like he's got five years left in him, but you know, I, I think you can get two more out of Kelsey at a at a tight end. Top five, top six output per year. He was tight end one this year. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's or points per game. I mean, it's not. It, he just didn't lap the field. That's why yeah. people think it was a bad year. Came back uh, down to earth. That's about it. yeah. Right, came back down to earth. But in the last, you know, in the playoffs in the last part, of it, he came alive again. So we'll we'll see. It's it's an interesting conversation. Um, we're gonna take a very short break, not for the YouTube audience, for the podcast audience. Stick with us. We'll be right back talking about Cody's favorite wide receivers as you get into the middle of your dynasty rookie drafts. And we're back. I'm Alan Zislowski, rotorwire.com. This is the Dynasty Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm here with Cody Carpentier. Cody, just before we continue with our, our top 10 rookies, just very quickly tell everyone that um, is hearing you for the first time, which I hope that you're not because Cody's on this podcast every year, uh, just quickly where they can find you and what the, the piece of work that you're most proud of that you're working on right now or have in the last few months. Uh, well, I just put up my top 25 wide receivers in the 2024 NFL draft. That's up at rosterwatch.com. Mostly all my content is up at rosterwatch.com. And then I also got Patreon. The easiest way to get there is just the draft rankings.com. That's to go over to the Patreon where I have all my other write ups and stuff as well. All right. Love it. And you can follow them as I do. Uh, on X on Twitter at Carpentier NFL, one of the best follows on Twitter. If you love rookies, dynasty stuff like that. All right. Cody, we're talking about our our top rookies that you need to draft. There's a lot of focus on the top six or seven players, and for good reason. A lot of times, those are the guys that really actually make a difference, right? I mean, yep. it, of course, you're always going to get third round found money like Tank Dell and Puka Nakua, but those are a little bit more rare than usual. Usually, when you get into those later rounds of rookie drafts, you get a spot start running back, right? You find Tyler Algier, Brian Robinson. Those guys are fine, but you plug them in on certain weeks. You don't get guys do ascend. Is there anyone that has ascended that's been like a true third round rookie pick that descended to, um, you know, top two round, top three round startup draft value and that you can think of in the last five years? Uh, I mean, P Puka Nakua is the easy one, right? He's right. now Puka and Tank. Up, uh, yeah, Puka and Tank have jumped all the way up in that conversation. Anyone else? It feels like every year there. I mean, Amon Ross St. Brown a couple of years ago jumped up he into was, that conversation. He too. was still like a second round, like even though he was like yeah. mid to late second round. I'm talking about guys that went the third, fourth, or fifth round of rookie draft. I, I couldn't think of one. I know I put you on the spot. I, I didn't prepare yeah. you for that question, but yeah, you did. Um, maybe in single quarterback, Jalen Hurts was a third round pick. That's maybe. a good one. 
but that would be single quarterback, not super flex. But yeah, I can't think of anybody as I look, um, I'm looking at the wide receiver rankings, like, you know, dynasty rankings. Uh, and man, I mean, everyone here was a top six pick. I mean, you know, the, the wide receiver 11, Brandon, Ayuk, he was like an early second round pick. Um, yeah, I mean, right. So that's my, okay. Nico Collins might be one that was a late second, early third round yeah. pick. It's now in the top 15. Yeah, I'm looking at my dynasty rankings too. I've seen, I mean, all these guys are I'm just trying <laughs> to think back. It's just, well, that's my point is we spend an inordinate amount of time on the on the back half of the first round and in the second and third round. Yeah. But at the end of the day, what matters are these elite prospects. And that's why yeah. I know that you've plowed over them a million times. But there, this area of the draft we're about to get into now, pick seven through 12, I still think that one of these guys could be a top 25 player, and that's why yeah. I want to focus on those guys. All right, outside yeah. of Neighbors and Marvin Harrison, who's the next, just lightning round them off, and then we'll we'll talk about each one. Who are the next four wide receivers in your rankings? Roma Dunze, wide receiver from Washington. Um, I think he's, there's a tear break between the two and uh, Neighbors and Harrison and then down to Dunze, but I think it's a very, very tight tier. I think you talk to people on the NFL side and like Daniel Jeremiah likes a Dunze uh, more than or equal to these other guys. Uh, Troy Franklin from Oregon, the wide receiver, 6'387 pounds. That's my next wide receiver. Adonai Mitchell from Texas. Um, he's kind of interchangeable. Him and um, Xavier Worthy, both guys from Texas. Tough kind of a splitting hair type of a situation, whichever your, your flavor um, you prefer. Um, those are kind of the next two guys. Um, Brian Thomas, I think there's probably okay. going to end up being in that conversation when the I want to ask you about him, Bri draft, Brian but, Thompson. Okay. So yeah. where's, give me his whole background, his measure. And by the way, uh, our guy, Anthony in the chat said, Kyron Williams is a top 30 startup pick that was that's, drafted. In the yeah, that's a good one, go. man. Good job. Yep. If so, if you were playing at home and were yelling at the uh, radio or your earphones, you found one. Yeah, there you go. All right. Yeah. Brian, uh, Brian Thomas, give me, give me his whole, uh, talk to me like you're talking to my grandma. It, this guy is prolific. He was in the offense with Jaden Daniels and Malik Neighbors, who guys we just talked about in the top five. Uh, went to LSU for three seasons, six foot five, 198, 205 pounds. You know, fits that Randy Moss downfield, deep stretch, prolific wide receiver build. Uh, averaged 17 yards per reception, had 17 touchdowns, led the nation in touchdowns this season. His speed at the line of scrimmage caused a lot of headaches for cornerbacks, even some of the best cornerbacks in this class, Terry on Arnold and Kool-Aid McKinstry from Alabama. 10 of his 17 touchdowns were for 25 or plus yards downfield. The problem I see is his struggles with contested catches in the short areas. Uh, I don't like his route running in the, in the, in, in, in the intermediate. Um, I don't think while pressing uh, defenders downfield, his motor tends to run a little idle. Maybe he knows the ball isn't going towards him. If it's going to Malik neighbors or somebody else on the field, I think this player in the NFL needs to be on a potent, creative offense that's going to game plan around him and not just have him go out there and run wind sprints um, two, three, four, five, six times a game. He needs to have someone go out there and draw up two, three, four, five, six plays a game specifically for him to win and to dominate and, and target him four or five times in a game, like a Cincinnati, a Philadelphia, a Dallas. If he goes there, it, the conversation of Brian Thomas will vault up in fantasy football, but if he yes, doesn't he go there... Is you know, he a first-round pick in the yeah. NFL? Is he a, like a true first-round pick, or is he like teetering? He, he most people will tell you he's a first-round pick. I I believe he should be teetering, um, but yeah. the speed he's likely to run with this week at six five, two hundred pounds is probably going to make him that fourth wide receiver drafted in the class. What if he's the this year's Kansas City takes him at thirty-two receiver? And you know, like we've gone back and forth where Sky Moore got pushed up. Everyone drafted him disappointed this year. Or the last year, Rishi Rice get, is the second round wide receiver, and then nobody wants him because of what happened to Sky Moore. So let's say Brian Thomas is the Kansas City guy. They take it 32. That would be hypothetically, that would be the perfect landing spot because they could get rid of Marquez Velda Scantling, and he's a better version of Marquez Velda Scantling. He's done it this past year with Jaden Daniels. And Jaden Daniels is equally, uh, if not more accurate than is Patrick Mahomes. And Mahomes is going to put that ball up there a lot for Brian Thomas, as he should. So that would be another spot. Cincinnati, Dallas, Philly, add Kansas City to the list. Those are four creative offenses that I would be interested in Brian Thomas on. But again, when we're talking about this, it, it's a very volatile player. I've drafted him on underdog five, six times already. What round? Like the last two weeks. Um, 
would you say what round? What round is he? Is Brian? Because I've done underdogs. I I kind of avoid the rookies because people want them more than I do. I just end up taking yeah. like a lot of the vets. So is he like fifteenth round or is he more like? Is he last round guy? I mean, it. Where is he right now in these early underdog drafts? About. I mean, not exactly, but just um, ish. I took him. I took him seventy sixth overall. So that's aggressive. Yeah. Oh, I think okay. his ADP is 79, I, the, but this is the thing. He's my wide receiver three on that team. And I feel good about having him in that situation to, um, again, I, all I'm betting on taking him. And I don't, again, I don't love Brian Thomas. I have him ranked much lower than the majority of people yeah. in the space, but if you can get him into a, a situation where he's not your number one, number two, if, if he's in an NFL offense as your number two or your number three, it's going to be very prolific. And the abilities of, you know, the 17 touchdowns he had at LSU last year, they didn't come because he was the alpha. Malik Neighbors was the alpha. They came because he was able to stretch the field and be that other guy on the offense. And I think in a situation like that, you know, hypothetically a Buffalo too, if he was to go and replace Gabe Davis on the opposite side of Stephon Diggs, that would be disgusting. What about uh, the last hypothetical spot is if for some reason Mike Evans and Tampa can't work out anything and Tampa is in the receiver market in the, I think they're, they're picking 26. Yep. Is that in uh, let's say Baker Mayfield resigns is, and then he becomes inserted as like the number two behind uh, Chris Godwin? Is that a little bit you know, more bearish? I like it. I, I I wouldn't mind it. I don't think he's uh, I don't think he has the route savviness of a Mike Evans, but I do think he'll be. Uh, it, it kind of fits what what uh, Mayfield is good at, and that's just ripping that ripping that potato downfield. And I think that's something Brian hmm. Thomas would. It would work. I just don't think it would be a. Again, like I said, it, the situation has to be good, but also like the staff has to be able to pl- use him creatively. And I, I'm not sure how much I love that Tampa Bay staff. As far there's as always people. a there's always a highly skilled wide receiver prospect that it just seems there's an, a disproportional amount of uh, skepticism on this year. Yeah. I mean, it's Keon Coleman, yeah. right? Wide receiver out of Florida State. Start with the negative. Why? Why is he the guy that's being? Um, let's say the you know tomatoes are thrown at him. That you know, it, you know, the one year that was Kadarius Tony, right? Like I shouldn't yep. be a first round pick. I mean, talent wise, they were wrong. Situa- you know, actual production wise and situational, people were right. So is Keon Coleman? You have him as your ninth ranked receiver. Would you take him in the first round of like a dynasty rookie draft, or and where do you project him to go? No, I, I would not take him in the first round of a dynasty rookie draft. Uh, I feel much more, much better about Keon Coleman, probably around like the 204, 205, 206 area. Um, that's kind of where I've I've seen him get to in mocks, and that's where I would start to feel good about him. I've seen him drop down to 209. I've seen him go 201. So I think the, the range of outcome, like you mentioned, is going to be kind of vast as far as the expectation of where he goes. This guy, he's pretty prolific as far as the overall output that he brought last year, but his yards per route run um, were not the same level of his teammate, Johnny Wilson. He's a much better receiver than Johnny Wilson. Sorry, Fusu Vu. Uh, mm-hmm. But Keon Coleman, very good uh, contested catch radius, uh, red zone dominance. Him and uh, Adonai Mitchell, who's about 15 pounds lighter, are two guys that kind of are getting overshadowed because of the big receivers in this class, it's Marvin, right? Six four. Yeah. You have Mitchell higher than the consensus. I see that. Correct, well, and yeah. and I, I feel good about that. I, I if he's both of these guys are, are pretty nasty. Um, when you get talking in, into the twenty, the red zone, the contested situations, and some people are a- anti. You know, people have grown into this anti contested. If they're in a contested situation, that means they're not good. Not separated. Open, right? Well, the dude, he's six four two ten. He's not exactly going to run a four two like. It's not all these guys are going to be able to separate create three, four yards, uh, you know, between the defender. It's not, it doesn't happen every single time. Um, so you're going to have to have guys, you know, like a Sidney Rice that's going to be able to go up and go for 1,200 yards and 12 touchdowns in an offense. That happens. Do you need that? And Keon Coleman and Adnan Mitchell give me a lot better feeling um, as far as being NFL prospects than does a Quentin Johnson from last year, who you know fits into the same you know, conversation that you're bringing up right now. Um, guys, every year that kind of get pushed aside and questioned a Christian Watson type of a situation. So uh, Keon Coleman brings a lot to the table. I think people just maybe aren't enamored with some of the underlying metrics like the yards per route run or him not being able to run, you know, under a four or five Oh type of a situation, but he's, he's, he's a pretty good wide receiver, man. Also yeah. Javon Baker, Henry, yeah. Depp, shout we'll, out. We'll get it. We'll get into Baker. He's on our list right here. So they know how to um, poke you in the right way there. Yeah, right? It, for those <laughs> listening, somebody wrote Javon Baker in the chat, and I know that's one of Cody's guys. So we're 
it is, you know, we'll, we'll get into that momentarily, but the reason going back to Keon Coleman, one of the, the things that I like about him and that I like about any college receiver, especially the playing at the, the level, the, the competition level is almost 20 touchdowns, 18 touchdowns in two years. That's always a good sign. I always think like, People say, like when you talk about running backs, like anyone can plunge in a one yard. No, there's guys that are good on the goal line. Doesn't necessarily mean they're, yeah. you know, 250 pound running backs, right? Like Derrick Henry. But there's like guys that know how to like find the little creases and the holes. And I still think, well, it definitely, I think it's obvious that touchdown scorers is a skill in as, as a pass receiver too. You're operating in a smaller part of the field. And anytime I see Coleman, 11 touchdowns last year, seven the year before, that's an actual skill. And, you know, last I checked, NFL teams need points. Is there something specific that Coleman did? Is it just his frame at the college level, 6'4", yeah. that allowed him to score those? Or is he a guy that understands, like, he's a, a pure touchdown scorer that could translate into the NFL? I think that's an interesting thing you bring up, too, is that the fact that he did have double-digit touchdowns this year. And I brought up Johnny Wilson just a second ago, who has better underlying metrics, like yards per route run, which is a very translatable uh, stat to the NFL. Johnny Wilson had two touchdowns. Johnny yeah. Wilson is uh six foot seven, 237 oh. pounds at wide receiver. And Keon Coleman had 11 touchdowns. Wilson had two. So it tells you exactly what you, what you just asked or what you just said is, you know, touchdowns are not projectable Still. or anything like that. You can't say, well, this guy scored 10. He's going to score 10. It's, that's not how it works. Things, situations are situational, but, it's a skill, like you mentioned. You have to be able to find those creases, and if you can create separation in those short areas and you can make those contested uh, catches and, and, and contort like most people can't, which is something Keon Coleman can do with very strong hands, that does translate. And if you're, the ball is put in a place for you to win, you're going to win. Mm. All right. Uh, let's say that, uh, you know, when we were talking earlier about quarterbacks, you mentioned J.J. McCarthy, but I forgot to kind of tack him into our conversation here. Um, he seems to be the, the polarizing guy. I, I, I talked to someone who asked me the other day that they're in in a rookie draft and someone offered them James Cook, the running back on the Buffalo Bills for 108. And he goes, do you think I should take it? I said, well, it depends on how you feel about J.J. McCarthy and Superflex, right? Because mm -hmm. that's basically what you're giving up if – if presumably the top six, including Bowers and Roma Dunze, go one through seven, obviously anything can change. So now you're looking at JJ McCarthy. He's like, oh, I hate JJ McCarthy. So I guess one, JJ McCarthy, the incoming rookie quarterback out of Michigan, give me all the uh, the the stats I need to know and what his game could look like translating into the NFL. Now I know you said like Atlanta's the nut spot, but let's just call it like a neutral spot, like say Minnesota, for example, which has good good weapons. I mean, I'm, you know, but, and Kirk cousins moves on to another team. So that in mind, JJ McCarthy, what should we know? I, I would, I mean, I would love the Minnesota spot. That's actually where I've mocked him in my latest mock 4.0 over at rosterwatch.com was to the Minnesota Vikings. Granted, it was at pick 34, 33. I think, I do think he gets into round one. Um, his past completion percentage jumped up 8% this year. Uh, he kind of doubled down on situations with 22 touchdowns. He didn't have to throw as much in, in 2023 because his team was so run dominant. Um, his frame is a little bit light. It's 197 pounds. Hopefully he comes into combat about 205. But I, it, I, it's just like the Bryce Young thing last year. He weighed 205, but people know. People conversed with the, with the, uh, with the team. And his game play size is probably closer to 195. And that, that can grow um, throughout the process. But I think the big thing about J.J. McCarthy, he's just a straight-up winner. I think he had one loss in his entire career in college, uh, and it came in 2022, I believe, against the uh, TCU in the national semifinal um, was the game. But McCarthy's an extremely accurate quarterback, extremely poised guy off the field. He's got everything dialed in uh, as far as the um, growth factor, the mentality, the maturity. Uh, and he, he's not a guy that has many limitations. He's going to be able to make all the throws. And he's one of the guys – this coming week at the NFL Combine, I'm most excited to look at. I want to see – I don't expect Caleb to throw, but I expect McCarthy to be out there, Penix, Nix, um, uh, McDa uh, Daniels, not McDaniels, Daniels, Jaden Daniels from LSU. I expect all these guys to be out there throwing. And I don't think J.J. McCarthy is going to look out of place. I think a 6'3", 205, 200 pounds, whatever it is, he's going to be out there slinging dots 72% this year in completion percentage. He's going to be putting the ball in the right places, and I think it's going to be very, you know, a very – Deep conversation after the combine when people see him and Jaden Daniels throw side by side because we got to see Daniels throw the ball 500 times this year. 
We didn't get to see that. We saw 333 pass attempts, 370 dropbacks from Jaden Daniels. So about half of the output um, that we sorry for from JJ McCarthy. So about half the output that we saw from Jaden Daniels. So uh, I think people are just more. Is that the knock on him that he doesn't have that doesn't throw that's, a lot? Is that's that? that's literally what people have knocked him for, and I don't think it's deserving. But it makes sense with the nature of the world we live in, which is I didn't see it, it didn't happen, right? It's what happened. What was the nearest thing that just happened? Well, we saw LSU not be good, but throw the ball sixty times a game. We saw Jaden Jaden Daniels. Uh, rush for 100 yards every game. We saw him throw for 400, 500 yards. We saw him win the Heisman. McCarthy won the national championship, but, I mean, that defense, that offensive line's got seven dudes in the draft. They ran the ball for 200 yards a game. He was just a game manager. It's like Brock Purdy in the NFL, yeah. how people they, talk they, about him. They just lazily push it off. He's like, yeah, he's just a game manager. He ain't. And it's like, well, no, that's not how that works. So I think it's going to be a bigger conversation once the combine happens, once he's throwing side-by-side side with uh, Jaden Daniels. And if you're a starting quarterback or a quarterback that has first-round draft capital, like, you know, I'm thinking back to Jordan Love from a couple years ago. He was drafted in the first round, wasn't a starter. And I have a chance to take you in a Superflex Dynasty rookie draft in the yeah. middle of the first round. That doesn't happen usually. Like, you know, if I'm sitting there and I have Matt Stafford and Geno as my quarterbacks, I'm happy for this year. But who knows what that's going to look like a year from now with either guy having a starting job, Matt Stafford retiring. And if you're, you know, you've done well, you've made the playoffs, you just got bad luck in the first round, you're sitting there, pick 108, 109, and you're going to have to make a decision between some of these these uh, receivers that you like, like the Troy Franklins at Oregon or Xavier Worthy at Texas. And, you know, and, and I think if you need a quarterback, a starting quarterback of first round draft capital, how are you sizing those uh, J.J. McCarthy up against some of your favorite wide receivers in that range, Cody? Uh, it's definitely going to be team dependent. Uh, currently, as it stands, I'm preferring Troy Franklin in that conversation, but my door is already open. I don't have to kick it down. I don't. It's not locked. Nothing. The door is wide open, and J.J. McCarthy is ready to walk through it. I just want to see it next week, and I want to see the NFL respect him from a draft capital standpoint. And, and if he gets boosted up, and he becomes the fourth quarterback in the top 10 conversation, and he potentially gets that Atlanta landing spot, and he potentially goes to, like you mentioned before, Minnesota's there at 11. I would love Minnesota. You know, that's another situation that you could argue is better than Atlanta. They have an offensive line that's, I would say, nearly completed. They could use another guy there, but Addison, Jefferson, Hawkinson, come on. Yeah. Come, what are we doing here? Like McCarthy easily slots into there. And brings that seventy percent plus completion percentage to the NFL. He's six three. He's not tiny. He's not tiny. He's not, you know, five eleven like Bryce Young. Yes, he's a little slight, but that's fine. He's got mobility, and I think it's a good quarterback that translates. And in that situation, if he if he does get the NFL respect of a top fifteen draft pick in a good offense, he will one hundred percent for me jump ahead of Bowers. Yeah, and it's not even going to be Bowers Franklin. It's going to be. Uh, Caleb May, Harrison, Daniels, Neighbors, Adunze, and McCarthy will be in that same tier, like I mentioned before. Bowers, Franklin are in the next tier for me as uh, McCarthy's. He would vault that tier if he does get top 15 draft capital in an offense like a Minnesota, uh, like an Atlanta. Yeah, I, could he be the Will Levis, like the guy from this year, meaning like someone that we're talking I don't mean skill-wise. I mean, just someone that we're talking about could be a yeah. top a one overall pick, two of, and then he ends up being like an early second-round pick. Is that in the, the range of, of – probable outcomes for McCarthy, he could fall out of the first round. I, I, I mean, I don't think it's out of the question uh, for sure. Like he, you know, he could have a bad process this next week and bad pro day and things like things of that nature. But I, I think the player that fits that mold this year is closer to Bo Nix where Nix you're actually seeing the conversation be, Oh, maybe he goes 15. Like you've seen big name mocks, put him 15 to the Raiders. You've seen big name mocks continue to put him up there. And then you've seen some mocks put him in, you know, like in the forties. So I think there's a wide range there on Bo Nix, and he fits the archetype and the prototype where he's more of a projectable asset, uh, played 60 games in college at Oregon, uh, and that started out at Auburn and grew through that process. But he fits more into the Will Levis uh, mold where there's more question marks around him, I think, than there is J.J. McCarthy. Yeah. Cody, you've gotten better. You know, you're always great at this. You've gotten better at it. I mean, always polished and stuff, but it just it's, it really is interesting and, and a treat to hear you talk about this stuff. I mean, you, you, you feel at home. You look, you're passionate ever about it. Are you enjoy? Are you still enjoying the work as much as ever? I'm still enjoying the work, man. And I, 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 
think I'm enjoying it even more. I started a, a, another gig over. I told you this before the show. I started over at OrangeBloods.com doing some doing some stuff with uh, with Alex Dunlap. Uh, for Tell Texas people about Sports. that. And I think something that's it's a good thing you at the the way you answered that question brought me to this thought was it's kind of like a re, not that I needed a rejuvenation or anything, but I'm starting to like do more recruiting stuff. So looking at like. 2025 recruits kids that are juniors in high school fresh coat of paint fresh coat of paint yeah it's like an entirely different level of uh, it's just it's another thing right we've been watching these prospects i've been watching you know d line in the nfl going to the nfl watching nfl watching college when you get to that you open that new book up it's a fresh book it's 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 just it's it's another thing so i i I love this man this this game i mean you know what it is it's just working from working from home and being being able to do the thing you love talk about the game you love and converse with people like you and and i've been on like six podcasts this week and it's just the conversations i think are the number one thing where it's not just about you sitting at home being by yourself studying it's about having conversations with people and being asked the tough questions to make you reconsider huh if I said this, well, then how come my ranking doesn't show that? And I right. think that's you know different different things that can come to light. Well, I can tell in your voice and your demeanor that you're. That's why I said it. It's the first thing I noticed. Like, oh wow, he's talking about all of this stuff that even though you've probably plowed over a million times, I'm trying to maybe yeah. at least engage you in a different way. But you seem as passionate ever about it, and it really does come through. And and I know I appreciate, appreciate that. that. And I know anyone listening to the Road to Wire Dynasty podcast appreciate it too. You're you were probably I would say uh, one of the most asked for. Uh, guests that we get so uh, we definitely appreciate appreciate giving us time um let's talk with javon baker all right um give me everything i need to know uh that's important and is he going to be the the question really is is he someone because in a couple leagues where i won my league i'm going to do a little humble brag right here i have the 12th pick who's the the wide receiver the player i should be targeting is is javon baker that guy at the end of the first round javon baker for me i've labeled him mr 206 in superflex Ah, okay Um, Right. In, in 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 one QB, that conversation is going to be there at the turn there. So um, give me all his measurables and all that stuff, and you know where he went to school, the high, all that stuff. So yeah, so I, I think when the conversation comes down to one QB, he's going to be in that 111, 112, 201 conversation. But Javon Baker from Central Florida, six one and a half, two oh eight. He's, he fits the archetype. He's a little bit bigger, but he plays with the same stylistic route running that Stephon Diggs brings to the table. Kind of similar to a route, closer, I guess, to a Rashi Rice size than anything. Um, probably going to go in the third round of the NFL draft. He broke out at 21. Good reason for it. It was a little bit late breakout, whatever. Um, but he was a four-star prospect that actually went to Alabama, and he played with the who's who at Alabama. He was there with Devonta Smith, Jalen Waddle, John Mechie, Jamison, Isaiah Bond, who's at Texas right now. Jermaine Burton, who's in this draft class, he was there for two years, won a championship. They weren't giving him the opportunities. So he packed his bag and he left. He went to Central Florida, went for 1,000 yards this year, 49 out of 52 receptions, went for first downs or touchdowns. He won all 12, all Big 12, um, uh, all Big 12 first team wide receiver. I think his footwork is some of the best in the class. His route running reminds me, like I said, of Stephon Diggs. He averaged 7.2 yards per, yards after catch um, per reception, 19th among Division One qualifiers. This guy is a dog, D-A-W-G. Um, I do think he lacks some downfield speed. Like, you know, he's not going to run a 4-4-0 by any means, but 4-5-2 is fine for a guy like this that can, um, like I said, run routes with the best of them. So um, I love me some Javon Baker. He's probably my my favorite um, middle-round wide receiver. A lot of people are kind of just out on him. They don't, they don't really have a reason, and I think well, that's more so just the lack of watching the tape, lack of, you know, diving deep into it and, and having an open mind. A lot of people, you know, this might be a take. A lot of people in the space – don't actually do the work. They just say it. They just read it. Ah, yeah, this guy looks good. I'm going to go with right. Drew Brian Thomas Bang. Javon Baker, you turn the tape on for this guy and you watch him for 10 minutes. You're going to say, what was the game? Yeah. What was the, what was the Baker game that I should watch? If I'm going to watch any of them, is there one that stuck out to you? Or is it just like little here from this game, little there from that game? That's fair. I, if that's the answer. I think it was kind of just a little bit of everything. It was. It, it took him a while to obviously get through the process, but in the connections that he showed this year with John Rice Promley, I think probably that Baylor one was the big breakout, but Oklahoma, when he traveled to Oklahoma for two touchdowns, that was probably the biggest right. game. Um, that and that was, the, that was kind of the wake-up moment. I saw, That was the first game I actually saw him during the season was the Oklahoma game. Um, I don't remember what the stat line was. But I, just, I know he scored two touchdowns in that one. but um, So, yeah, Cody. probably the Oklahoma one. Cody Carpentier, you follow him as I do at Cody Carpentier. Uh, sorry, at Carpentier NFL. With our last few minutes, Cody, what I want to do is absent from this conversation for the first time in a long time was running backs. 
right? Yeah. Usually running backs go one, two, or three, even a super flex. I mean, I know that that usually comes with first round draft capital. And I've looked at all the mock drafts. Nobody I've seen has, I, I don't think I've seen one mock draft where there's a running back in the top 32 picks. And um, I'm sure that's coming, right? People, you know, by a week before the draft, somebody's going to have that. But uh, a couple guys that could go in the first half of the second round is that Jonathan Brooks out of Texas or Braylon Allen running back from Wisconsin. Do those guys, are they locked in second rounders or they have a chance to go in the second round? In the NFL draft? Yeah, real NFL draft. Real NFL draft, I think it's three guys in that conversation, and a fourth could enter the chat uh, at the Combine this week. It's Braylon Allen, it's Jonathan Brooks, and Blake Corum currently has the highest ADP at mockdraftdatabase.com. Jalen Wright from Tennessee is 5'10 and a half, 5'11, 205 pounds. Um, he, he runs with electricity. He's got like a, a couple electricity bolts kind of coming out of his hips and just bolts. He's, he might run a 4 3 5 uh, this coming week at the combine. That's going to vault him up in a class that really, you know, isn't derived of speed, but is derived of a pure number one. People are going to be reaching for a guy like Wright. Uh, so I could definitely see uh, so my boy guys- Maddie do him says Philadelphia in the 50s. Like That's like a, a, a spot that could fit a guy like Jalen Wright. Right, but the, well, Philadelphia, their pick at 50, doesn't it go, is that the New Orleans pick, or they, they, uh, I can't remember which exact spot. Yeah, it is. all right, right, yeah, so mm, New, Orle- uh, New Orleans had pick 50, and that went to Philly. Yeah. Okay, all right, I'm Good looking enough. at on Tankathon. Um, so, th- those four guys, they all have a chance to go in round two, or are they more day th- uh, round three, type of running backs this year like basically yeah, I think the, who, who are the locked in round two running backs in the real nfl draft i'm gonna be honest with you i don't think there's any locked in anything brooks would have been the clear-cut numero uno if he didn't tear his acl uh in november would have won the doke walker award would have been back-to-back doke walker award winners for texas probably would have vaulted himself into a locked top 50 but at this current state you can scroll through Twitter. You can scroll through a lot of different NFL prospectus people or analysts and, and fantasy analysts. There is six different dudes labeled as RB1s. And in the NFL, it's really going to come down to scheme fit situations. My guy is Braylon Allen out of Wisconsin. He just turned 20 years old two weeks ago, and he's a 235 pound bowling ball, six foot two, four five four, four five three speed, kind of plays like Todd Gurley in the open field. That would be the guy I would draft. Would I draft him in the first round? No. I wouldn't draft any of these guys in the NFL first round. No, second round, though. But I do see probably probably that 50 spot is where the door opens, and you have Philly, you have Dallas, you have Green Bay, and you have Houston. How about Tennessee if Derrick Henry doesn't return at 38? Is that a spot for a big dude like uh, – I, I, I don't think they spend that high draft capital. I don't okay. think th- this class, again, like I mentioned, like there's a lot of guys in the conversation to be number one. If they're going to spend some capital, it's probably going to be the third or fourth round. They don't need a prolific guy. They need, I've mentioned this in other shows, they need a guy that can play like a Tony Pollard role. Like maybe they signed Tony Pollard or something like that, but uh, Tony Pollard next to a Tiger Spears. Spears could take a load. He can't take the whole load. I think he's a completely overvalued right now in, in, in underdog drafts, but uh, they they should they should go after somebody, but I would not do it on the, in, on, in the first two rounds. All right, so RB1, regard, let's say they go in the middle of the second round or late second round, so let's not even put a name onto it. So the first running back off the board and goes to a spot where presumably they need a running back. I mean, that's yeah. the team's not going to take him if they already have one. Um, where does that put him in our dynasty rookie drafts? I mean, having running backs, nobody wants running backs in dynasty anymore, but getting a 20-year-old running back uh, that's the RB1 in their class – that's valuable. I don't care what anybody else has told you about wide receivers. So where should that guy slot in? Let's say, I mean, what do you, your ideal, give me your ideal landing spot. Is it Philadelphia at pick 50? Yeah. Da- I mean, no, mine's my ideal landing spot is Dallas at 56. Okay. Um, Dallas. So, for, da- so he for, goes at 56, your number one running yeah, back 56. Yeah. Tony Pollard's not there anymore. Where does that running back, where should he go in our dynasty rookie drafts? In your dynasty rookie drafts in one QB, I think he automatically vaults up into the Troy Franklin conversation. Okay, so he's in the middle, right after Bowers. So okay. nine. All right, and in and in um, Superflex, just move it down three, four spots. Yeah, bingo, bingo. I don't think the Superflex it's a, it's a first round guy, but that landing spot is that situation. Braylon Allen to Dallas is about the nuts you can get in this entire class, in my opinion. Some people think Green Bay for uh, for for Braylon Allen. Some people like Brooks to Dallas, but Brooks is closer to Tony Pollard than he is to Zeke um, as far as a output standpoint. But 
Um, Braylon Allen to Dallas is the nuts of the 2024 class. All right, last question for you, Cody Carpentier. Give me your your late round dart throw. You, you've hit on a couple of these over the years. So who's a player that uh, that nobody's talking about that I need to draft at least a couple times in all my dynasty rookie drafts? So there's a couple of guys back here, but we've talked about a lot of receivers. I could name off Malachi Corley. I could name off Jalen Polk. I just named him because I like him, but I love and I want to see the testing come through. The MRIs are positive. The foot is healthy. For Dylan Johnson from Washington, this guy had 173 receptions over a four-year career at the running back position. Let me say that again. 173 receptions in a four-year career at running back. He averaged six yards per carry this year on that Washington offense and finally was given the opportunity to break out at 1,100 yards on the ground. Dylan Johnson, six foot tall, 215 pounds. Let me see you run a two hundred. Let me see you run a four five this next week at the combine and be healthy, and that's going to be a very valuable late second, early third round pick in rookie drafts. I love it, man. Appreciate appreciate your time. Appreciate you doing this. And like I said, my process. You know the the draft begins uh, with the Senior Bowl. My my draft process begins with Cody Carpentier. So I buddy. appreciate you, man. Yeah, as always, I every year. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And uh, we'll, we'll keep making this an annual tradition. All right, everybody, you can uh, follow me at Alan Zislowski, follow Cody at Car uh, Carpentier NFL, and we'll be back every Friday live and then every week in the Rotowire uh, Fantasy Football Podcast audio feed. We're we'll back next week with another edition starting our, our positional rankings. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.